Peggy? Oh, well, wait for the microphone. Uh, thanks. Uh, Peggy Ochowski, I'm the congressional correspondent for the Hispanic Outlook, and I've also written two books on immigration, and one of them was about the 1965 law. And uh, the two things that distinguished that was not only a priority on family unification, but a, 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 a rule that said you cannot prefer any national origin. So there was a complicated formula that was proposed, and I mean still works today, called the 7% rule, that no na nationality can have more than 7% of all the uh, green cards given out. And it seems to me if you give green cards to DACA, uh, people who are 85% Mexican, you are giving an extreme preference to a particular nationality. So I'm just wondering, is that nationality preference any kind of issue at all, or is that a dead issue now? Michael, did you guys address that yeah. in the commission? I don't think we did. Yeah. Uh, there was, uh, when we were writing, there was okay. an estimated, I'm sorry, estimated three million unauthorized migrants in a population of 3 million. It was considered a very serious problem. Uh, it's now estimated conventionally to be 10 million, 11 million, something. You know, nobody knows for sure because you can't measure a population accurately like this. So we weren't really dealing with that, that kind of issue. I would say, though, to go back to the 65 Act, the 65 Act, if you look at the history of the 65 Act that you referred to, the family preferences that were put in there and are still part of what the senator's talking about uh, were put in for the purpose of maintaining the national origins flow pre-1965 without having quotas. Do away with the quotas, but make sure that only people who are citizens of the United States can petition for their family members the expectation of the sponsors was that the national origins flow going forward would not change very much. They were wrong. It changed dramatically. That's an example of unintended. There's a whole paper written about this. I commend it to you by a well-known historian at NYU named David Reimers. Uh, he called it an unintended reform the 1965 Immigration Act and Third World Immigration to the United States. But it's worth national it. National origins limits still prevail. Yeah, yeah. But the idea of the, 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 the goal of the family reunion. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, somebody else will have to comment on that, I think. Yeah. Oh, go, no, you go ahead. All right. Um, the per country cap, the 7% rule, ha first of all, only applied to the preference categories and the uh, family and employment preference categories. But also, even that has been gradually eroded over time. One big reform was made after the IRCA amnesty um, when the beneficiaries, who, again, were largely citizens of Mexico, um, wanted to sp – their spouses were not legalized at the same time. Many of them were not even in the country. But when they were sponsored by the IRCA beneficiaries, that caused the waiting list in the spouse – of green card holders category to to spike very dramatically, and it was felt you know that's kind of a, a difficult question um, to ask people you know people to wait years and years to legalize their spouses. So Congress then passed a law that exempted, I think it's 73, 77 percent of the spouses from the per country cap, and there's talk now, I, I believe the RAISE Act eliminates the per country cap for the employment-based green cards. So we've been moving away from that for some time. Senator, do you have uh, anything to add on that? Well, no, I, Jessica, I was just going to remind that um, in the RAISE Act, we do do away with the per country caps. I just don't think that that uh, applies today in a global economy that we have. Um, and when you go to a merit-based system, it needs to be pure, in my opinion. Um, now, the other thing is that I will address uh, the DACA situation. You're, you're exactly correct. If, if there is a solution for that 800,000 to 2 million people, depending on what type of solution, you're going to throw that ratio out dramatically. But I think what happens here, and a lot of people have criticized this, that it will focus on two or three countries. Well, 
I don't, I don't subscribe to that America has to have X number of people from, X, from every country in the world. I mean, what we have right now is a fight for our way of life, frankly, economically, uh, and, and militarily, and socially in many respects. So um, what we're trying to do is get back to what helped make America great to start with, and that is that in the early part of the Industrial Revolution, we needed low-skill wage, uh, low-skill workers, and we got them. Today, we need skilled workers, and we're not getting them. Yeah, and I'd only add that the very mechanism of something like the RAISE Act is going to result in a more diverse immigration flow anyway. Because if most of the immigrants are either spouses of American citizens or they're picked through the point system that you know picks people based on their education and what have you, you're just not likely to have the kind of domination of the flow by one or two countries because half of the spouses, for instance, currently are... Um, earlier immigrants, U.S. citizens marrying people, but half of them are Americans, and they're going to marry people from all over the world. You study in Italy, you, uh, you, know, you study in Colombia for a year, you meet somebody. Likewise with the skills, uh, you know, it's going to be a much more, assuming it were implemented, it's a much more straightforward thing. You go on the website, you put in your information, and it'll tell you, the Canada does this, do you qualify or not, and you're going to end up with less sort of monopolization of the flow without having to do it explicitly the way the per country caps do it now. So let's move on to the next person. Uh, Neil Monroe here from um, Breitbart. So on the question of chain migration, uh, I'm wondering, uh, given what Senator McConnell said last night that he endorsed it, is this a success? But you know, the, the, what's the response of your colleagues to the question on chain migration? They're busy. They don't know a lot about particular issues. And the second question I have is, where do they get their information on polling? Because <laughs> I, I write about this for a long time, and a lot of my stories are, those polls are wrong. You'll notice the Trump election. And it seems to me that a lot of your members just don't know squat about the true numbers here. You know, it's my biggest frustration with um, coming from my world into this world is that I, I'm standing on... Uh, a very squishy platform here in terms of information. I never had that problem in a business because if you had that problem in business, you were out of business. And here we make, we, we make a lot of policy decisions on really half-baked data in many, I could not agree more with that. Um, let me give you the mood on this. First of all, um, people see me as a very reasonable person. I come from a world where you have to compromise to get things done. So this is not a, um, a rabid attempt to cut immigration numbers. Uh, this is a very rational approach to looking at a problem, dividing it into its pieces, and coming up with a solution. We need to get to temporary visas. There's no question about that. But if we com confuse the two today, we will never get any of this solved. So the data we looked at went back to the Commission's work. We've looked at CIS. We've, we've gone to places like Canada and Australia and then compared it to Eastern Europe and looked at Germany and France and places like that to look at what other people are doing. So. We're very comfortable with the fact that um, looking at the needs of the U.S. economy and looking at our national security needs, that going to something like this on the legal side is just what uh, Mark said. In Canada, you go online and you put in your particular it, – it's like applying to a college almost. You see what's easier. important. It's actually easier. No and, essays. But you can prepare, too. For example, if, if – um, if, if you have a job offer or if you're of a certain age, and you mentioned age, Mark, I want to address that. You know, with American population being, our, our average age is about 50 today. Um, and that's a problem because people are retiring earlier and earlier and putting more and more pressure on the social systems and so forth. The workers, um, you know, we, age is a, is a benefit for someone coming in and applying in this system because they'll have a longer runway to be contributory. So I couldn't agree more. I think the mood in our in our caucus, anyway, is that ending chain migration is a top priority. When you have the the the, the uh, majority leader of one of the of, of the Republican caucus say that he is in favor of eliminating chain migration, um, I think that's a that's a milestone. And he has looked at this bill. He's look, and we've talked about it in our caucus. Um, the thing now is 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 we believe that before March, you've got to have a solution on DACA legislatively. And therefore, this gives us an opportunity to raise this as an issue and to try to get uh, Democratic support to a bipartisan solution somehow. Any sign of Democratic support at the moment? Uh, well, you know, <laughs> uh, un until you get a vote, uh, there's no such thing as Republican or Democratic support in my, in my experience. I mean, people will talk a lot, but uh, there's a lot of posturing going on right now. 
And so um, I'm, I'm maybe a little naive on this, but there is a solution to be done here. Um, and, and it's one that I think people would look at and say this is going to set America up to become competitive again with the rest of the world. And I think one thing I'd add before the question is that, um, and this is something I think Senator Cotton has, uh, has talked about publicly as well as you, Senator, is that this isn't just horse trading. In other words, the Rays Act isn't just a good idea and here we have an opportunity with DACA to get uh, it through Congress. It actually is related to DACA in the sense that DACA is going to have certain harmful consequences. Right. It's going to almost certainly attract more illegal immigration and, as Jessica pointed out, spark more chain migration so that something like the Rays Act is necessary as a kind of damage control component of a DACA fix rather than just horse trading. We'll pick one from column A and one from column B. I'd like to pile on to one thing Jessica said and remind everybody that if, if you just did a pure DACA solution under current law, the problem with that is the parents then will be the ne in five years right. will be the next person that gets uh, gets included. And I have a particular problem with that because what makes the DACA uh, young people a little different is they haven't yet violated federal law. Their parents did. Right. Um, next question. Dr. Teitelbaum, Roy Beck, Numbers USA. So in uh, 95, 96, 97, you looked at chain migration. You did not Rec make any recommendations on parents. Now I'm looking at I'm looking at DACA's gra uh, at uh, I'm looking at this graph uh, from Jessica. It looks like maybe I don't know around 45,000 parents at the time the commission was uh, delivering its results, and looks like maybe around 140,000 today. I mean, it's at least tripled. D do you th do you think that that would maybe the commission would have looked at parents in a different way if they had seen how high this was going to go? Yeah, it's hard to say. Um, the commission operated, uh, the, the chair of the commission was of the view that if we weren't in substantial agreement, we shouldn't make a recommendation. So there are some things we didn't even mention about immigration, like, for example, student visas. We didn't discuss student visas. And they Because there's too much... Diversity the commission population. was not, in a, any sense, in ha, did not have any even close to a consensus on on that subject. On on the parents, I think the numbers were, as you indicated, it wasn't a, a major issue at that point. I don't know that the commission expected it would grow. I mean, the Congress can be wrong, as I've said, and ought to change things, and commissions can be wrong too, and not realizing that. Certain things are underway that they are un unaware of. And, and just a quick follow-up. <clears throat> Your opinion, and then maybe a little speculation about the commission, uh, Senator Perdue and, and Cotton's, uh, uh, the way they handle parents is to end the immigration of parents, but to allow immigrants to, to bring their parents uh, on long-term visa, uh, visitor visas so they can take care of them. So, so the humanitarian aspect is dealt with, but you you stop the chains through that. Does that is that uh, you think that would have was was anything like that even taught, mentioned by anybody? No. Okay. If you could hand it back there, yeah. Okay. Okay, thank uh, thanks, uh, Fred Lucas with the Daily Signal. Uh, I, I had two questions actually. Uh, first one, uh, it's just a purely political question, but uh, uh, do do you think uh, having DACA on this bill, uh, you know, marrying DACA with the Rays Act? Uh, that will sort of box Chuck Schumer and other Democrats in to supporting or, or to ending chain migration if you tie it to Dockers and, you know, quote unquote, the dreamers? Well, we're not suggesting that we tie it to DACA. All I've said is I, I want to stop the conversation about uh, DACA as a singular um, issue relative to a solution because I, I just don't think under current law there is a solution for DACA because of the, of the parent, uh, parental, um, the chained immigration dimension of it. So we've said, look, if you're going to have a solution on DACA, you've got to at least engage on raise and end chain migration. Yeah, but, I mean, uh, would you consider it like a single bill? Look, this is, this, the next few weeks are going to be very interesting. First, we've got to get tax done, hopefully, this week. But then I think you, you'll start having, as they, they move into the year-end funding uh, conversation, uh, as we parallel that here, you're going to see a lot of conversation about this immigration issue. So the way Congress works is we, we negotiate. And so I wouldn't preclude any kind of conversation right now except that I have some certain precepts. One is that 
beyond anything else, we have to end chain migration. And I'm saying that as a business guy. I don't know the political ramifications of that. I mean, we've had a lot of people studying this, but think about this. I mean, the last time we actually changed the, our, our immigration law was 1990. I mean, that's it's time to review. The world has changed dramatically since then. I think we can get a deal done. So it may include some facets of all of this. All right, and uh, th this question could probably be for, for Senator and, and others, but um, uh, the current system with chain migration brings in a lot of low-skilled workers that displaces American low-skilled workers. Moving to a merit-based system, would that in the long term lead to displacing American educated high school, he'll, sorry, high skilled workers? Well, there's always that opportunity, but look, why, why wouldn't America be the brain sink? You know, I've never believed that innovation has an upper limit. And uh, innovation, capital formation, and the rule of law is what created the economic miracle we've all enjoyed here in the United States since 1946. So, you know, I, I just, um, I'm of a mind that right now what we're doing is we're educating a lot of young people around the world coming to our college and university. The number one export we have, the highest quality export we have, I believe, is our, our secondary uh, education system. Michael, Mike may, Michael may uh, disagree with that, but I really believe that's one of our greatest exports. The problem is we're educating these young people, giving them diplomas, in many cases putting them on scholarships, and then not giving them a green card. Let me give you a little anecdote. My home state of Georgia right now does more traditional movies than California. That's a fact. Now, the, the problem is the digital movie development, which is the fastest growing part of the movie industry, is actually Canada and now the UK. Why? Well, a lot of kids go to our schools on scholarship, get their degrees, and many of these are engineers and programs and so forth, high-tech, skilled workers. They can't get a green card. They end up going to Canada. And so Canada right now is the leading uh, growth area for digital movie making. So I'm, I'm of an opinion that Nobody knows what this limit ought to be, what a number should be, but we can, we will find out. Uh, but first, we got to stop chain migration and go to a merit-based immigration system. Let's take uh, one last question uh, here. Yeah, I just want to add. Oh, my name is Steve Camerata. I'm director of research at the Center for Immigration Studies. I just want to ask one big question. Everybody knows that if you just project out current trends in immigration, you're going to add about 100 million, maybe 110 million people to the U.S. population over the next half century. For a state like Georgia, it might mean it would go to 15 million. For the Atlanta metro area, you might add one to two million people to it through immigration. Can you give me some sense, Senator, of what the thinking of your colleagues is? Do they think, well, you know, if we grow the population by a third, that has no implications for quality of life or the environment? Or do they just not know, or do they not care? I guess that's sort of my question. What, what do they think? Do that doesn't matter, or, or it, they don't know? I'm kind of interested. <laughs> yeah, that's a big one, all right. <laughs> you know, I, I can't speak for my colleagues, but I can just say, look, it's been since 1990 since anything was done here. That kind of answers your question. And I'm, I don't think that's acceptable anymore. I think we've got to keep fighting until we get something done to change this. Aside from the, the, the growth in that, look, I, some immigration growth is very, very contributory. You know, the GDP consists of uh, productivity growth and population growth, right, among other things. So population growth, and our population growth is declining, just like most mature countries around the world. Uh, the rising economies, obviously, the populations are growing dramatically. So aside from the population growth, which is a tremendous problem, it's the, it's the type of of growth that you have. These are mostly low-skill workers that are not contributory to the system and actually are a drain on the system in many respects. So uh, I don't know if it's a lack of information, a lack of priority, or whatever. Congress typically does very well in functioning in a crisis. And so we have not defined this as a crisis. And what Tom Cotton and I are doing is calling this out as a crisis now, just like I have been on the debt. The debt is a crisis. This is part of the solution. If you want to grow the economy, you've got to fix your immigration system. It's just as simple as that. If you want to fix your national security system, you've got to fix your immigration system. It's not the only thing you have to do, but you certainly cannot ignore it. I mean, look what just happened in New York. Who would have believed that under the, quote, well-intended diversity visa lottery, you would have a terrorist come in? Well, we've been saying that now for four years, that you got to look at that. we got to look at that. I gave a speech early this year, called it out. And, I, you know, God forbid, I, I hate that it happened, but we ought to learn from that. So. I believe that we have now risen at a million people a year coming in a legal system where 950,000 of them at least are coming in with no consideration of their contributory ability, I think is a crisis. 
Thank you, uh, Senator. Thank you, uh, Dr. Teitelbaum and Jessica. Um, I'm not sure who will still be here to be accosted. The Senator probably uh, will have to run, but feel free afterwards uh, to come up and accost the other speakers. Um, we'll have the uh, proceedings up on our website at some point, probably next week. And thank you for coming, and hope to see you next time.